We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight's question comes from Jim Crocker of Jim Likes Games. Jim writes, Hey Bo, have you ever done a show devoted to RPG in a box, as I call them? Gloomhaven, Pathfinder, card game, etc. I'm not much of a board gamer, but I really like that kind of thing. Co-op with progression and such. Well, thanks for the comment, Jim. Uh, not only have I met Jim a handful of times at gaming conventions, I don't think we've ever actually sat down at the same table and played a game before, uh, but I've also bought a number of games off him at cons as he used to set up one of the best vendor booths I've ever seen for indie RPGs. Uh, that's actually where my copy of Tales from the Loop comes from, uh, my copy of Carry, a game about war, who I got Nathan to sign, and my copy of Phil Vecchione's Hydro Hacker Operatives came from. So it was cool to see something coming in from Jim. As for ever having done a show on RPG in a box games, no, we haven't, at nope. least not until tonight. Now, while we have mentioned various dungeon crawling board games and adventure games in the past when answering questions on other topics, we've never done a show specifically highlighting this genre of games. So Jim calls these RPG in a box games, but I think most people refer to this style of game as either dungeon crawlers or adventure games. But I think overall, we're going to have to narrow down exactly what games fall into this category, at least for our conversation tonight. Maybe not trying to polish the bucket and make a little perfect box to put them in, but at least to narrow down our conversation. Now, Jim has helped us out but here by calling these RPGs in a box. By doing so, we know he wants games with RPG elements, and he <laughs> specifically mentions two of these, cooperative and having some form of progression. So that's definitely going to narrow things down quite a bit, eliminating an awful lot of what I would call like generic fantasy games with fantasy elements and board games. So I'm going to ask you, Sean, what do you think makes a game a dungeon crawler? Well, I mean, first off, I think it needs uh, some form of map progression. Again, if you're talking about dungeon crawling, <laughs> especially uh, you need a dungeon or some, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a fantasy dungeon. Uh, it could be a spaceship or what mm -hmm. have you, but there needs to be some form of sort of movement progression as well as with, like Jim suggested, character progression. Yeah. Yeah. For me, I think one of the biggest ones is, is having that character progression or, or team progression. It may not be you play a simple character, but like this could be as simple as gaining new equipment. Like you just get better gear by the time you finish the game or a full on RPG style level up system where you're spending points to increase stats or choosing between cards to add to a deck and games like that. Where this is going to knock out games like Doodle Dungeon and One Deck Dungeon because there is no progression in those games. Yeah, and I think, well, while, you know, the Doodle Dungeon is a fantastic game, uh, it's also very, I think well, that one's a, no, a Doodle Dungeon is not a solo game. That's the, I was thinking no, of the other not, one. No, it's not, no, no. I was thinking of Pocket, the Pocket one you just did. Um, and Pocket Book Adventures. Yeah, There's Pocket another Book one. Adventures. There is progression in that um, one, actually. There you go. Uh, and I think uh, he definitely he mentions co-op. So we're looking for multiplayer stuff, which, again, rules out that, <laughs> you know, that and yes. that rules out Doodle Dungeon as well. Um, mm -hmm. So you're looking for something, uh, you know, I suppose you could have a solo game. There's more than enough of these where you're playing multiple characters as a solo campaign. Yep. Uh, but generally, we're looking for something that's probably multiplayer uh, exploration with character or group progression. All right. Now, the big other one, and this is going to knock out a lot of games, including some I see the chat room already mentioning, is to really get that RPG feel. And what I think you need is some type of campaign mode where what happens in one game affects the next so that there is a change to the world. Now, I'm not just necessarily mentioning legacy games, but some form of campaign system, even if it's just a matter of you carry over your character who's now slightly better. This is going to knock out all the Zombicide games. It was my main complaint about Cthulhu Death May Die. Um, though good games, I don't consider them RPG in a box due to this. They are, you play through a scenario and that's it. Yeah, and this is this is a tough one. Because honestly, Zombicide um, or uh, the Cthulhu Death May Die are right on that edge. Yeah. Um, and the, the problem is they have a campaign, but they don't have carryover. So they don't have the mm -hmm. progression but Correct. they do have campaign, uh, whereas some have, uh, you know, some don't have a campaign, but they do have the, you know, it, it's, it's very tough to limit. And, and I 
think a lot of people are probably going to come down on the side where Death May Die is a dungeon in a box, uh, uh-huh. even though it doesn't have the progression. And, I, and I, I have to say, I agree with you. I want that progression. But uh, there is a campaign in Zombie Death May, nah, in Death May Die. There's scenarios. There's scenarios. There's a difference between a campaign and scenarios. Well, okay. but S- They're completely set- standalone where they don't affect each other at all. No, but there is a set pass path. This is the path you take. You play this scenario, then you play this scenario, and when you're done, you... Yeah, but then scenario, the scenario three doesn't call back to scenario one at all. Like, there's not even a story tied together. It's a bunch of separate events. The only real progression is they get more difficult and more complicated. That That's mechanical. That's, to me, is not... Uh, not, a, not a story at all, really. It's a bunch of individual separate stories. But the other thing in that one that knocks it out even more is there's zero character progression. Right. Y- your characters don't change at all. You, uh, you might. No, you do develop during the, during the game. I could have sworn. I um, don't remember getting any new abilities or anything like, yeah, your tracks might go up and there's a whole thing about maintaining your sanity. That's a big part of the game, but you don't like unlock anything new. I could have, oh, I thought you didn't. I thought that was I guess, I guess you, you collect a few things. Yeah. So I guess there's a bit of equipment. There's the whole thing where you make multiple choices and they go on either side of your player board. But again, no carryover, right? Like, well, like you play the, that character the, for the that one. That was the big problem with that game. That was one of the things that, that it was reminding me that there was some progression within a scenario is because why aren't we keeping this? Yes. Why not keep it? Scenario? Yes. Uh, and so that was one of those uh, those tough ones. So, yeah, I think that the big ones is some form of exploration, some form of character improvement, so some kind of and some form of progression where where one game affects another. I think those are the three key elements that I want to include in our games tonight. And we've got 10 games that fit that criteria to talk about. And then we got, I think it's three other games. I have to scroll down in our show notes where they break those rules, but we still think they're cool games. And then you're going to have three games that we want to play because all the games we're going to talk about tonight, at least one of us has played, uh, if not both of us. Uh, here, here's a Draconis Invasion. Is that a campaign or not? See, I don't think so. Dar- Darkonis, inv- you got no character. You don't even play a character. That that's a well, that, no, I'm not saying that that doesn't fit into this category. Absolutely not. Yes, uh, but again, it's it is a campaign. This is the order. It's, it's, to me, it's the same, and it's the story. Yes, um, you know, it's the to same me. That's the thing. exact same. That's the same as Cthulhu: Death May Die. Right. To me, it's it, again, it's a bunch of linked scenarios, but they're not even linked. Like. Like the Draconis again, like, oh, they're now in the forest. Oh, they're in the swamp now. Oh, they're getting close to the castle. Like, that's your story. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we've we've kind of narrowed this down. We've definitely right. uh, set up what we think. What we, we think, definitely yes. need to have. Whether or not everyone's going to agree with us, that's a whole different story. But Yeah, uh, true. So I, I will point out that Jeff Seuss is pointing out, yeah, there is some character progression. As, as you go insane in that game, you then build a skill tree. So there is some. But again, the, the main thing that knocks it out for me is the fact that what I did in Cthulhu Death May Die Scenario 1 versus Yug know, Sothoth doesn't matter when I play Scenario 6 versus Cthulhu. I don't even have the same characters. I don't even need the same players. There's no actual carryover. So now we got a better idea of what kinds of games we're talking about here. Let's move on to share our thoughts on some of the adventure games we played. Now, as usual, this list is in no specific order, and remember that these are our thoughts on dungeon crawling games that we've played, and isn't meant to be a comprehensive list of all the adventure games out there. If your favorite game isn't mentioned, hit us up in the comments and tell us all about it. Now, let's start off with one that Jim already mentioned, and that's Gloomhaven. This is a meaty, heavy cooperative, card-driven, fantasy tactical combat simulator with a multi-path, almost sandbox-like story progression and a detailed advancement system. Mm-hmm. There is a lot going on this in this game, and it's not easy, which means it's not going to be for everyone. Along with that, the game is a beast in length, featuring almost 100 scenarios as well as the ability to play random dungeons, and that ignores all of the fan-created content oh, yeah. out there. Gloomhaven is a commitment and pretty much a lifestyle game. Of course, we were big into this game before the pandemic, playing mm-hmm. almost weekly, but so far have not returned to it, no. as it would end up being the only game we play, and that's not good for the piles of shame, piles of obligation, 
or our viewers and listeners. Yes, it's true. Every week, here's what we did in Gloomhaven this week. And honestly, there was a period our show was kind of that. And we got some complaints. We did get some fans out of that, too. But we had we were talking a bit too much about Gloomhaven. I will admit, we we are still, it, it's, it's on the menu. It's possible we may return to it. But it will definitely happen once we have other gaming night schedules and can play some other stuff as well. And that was Gloomhaven which I guess probably could be totally replaced by Frosthaven now that people are getting it, but we haven't played that one yet. So next I have a follow-up to this, which is actually kind of a precursor to this. It's kind of like the Star Wars prequels of Gloomhaven, and that is Jaws of the Lion. Um, This takes the tactical card play, hand management, detailed combat system um, of Gloomhaven and tones it all down. It provides a fantastic five game onboarding system for new players and like this is a game i just wish existed before we played gloomhaven like we might not have lost the first four tries on scenario one had we had this onboarding that kind of introduces you to the 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 rather complicated card management and combo system required to play well i wish this was our starting point to the gloomhaven universe Jaws of Lion is a fantastic gateway to Gloomhaven, and this, I honestly still say, anyone considering playing Gloomhaven or Frosthaven should start. Now, note, while Jaws of the Lion is simpler than Gloomhaven and Frostbraven and any other Gloomhaven games, it's still not simple or easy. It's still fairly difficult. It's still not. This is not a hack and slash dungeon crawler where you're throwing dice and taking wounds and making saving throws. It's a very different style of game. This is still a meaty game, but I still say if you are even considering picking up Gloomhaven or Frosthaven before spending all the money on those giant boxes, at least find a way to play through those first five scenarios of Jaws of the Lion. That way you'll know if you even enjoy this style of game. And that was Gloomhaven, Jaws of the Lion. Learn more about how Jaws of the Lion differs from Gloomhaven through our reviews on the blog and YouTube. Now, next up, Jim mentioned the Pathfinder Adventure card game. Uh, this one's been out for a long time, but has a newer updated revised edition that came out just before the pandemic hit. And I think that's why we haven't seen a lot of expansions for the new edition. Now, that is the version I played. That was released in 2019. It's the one I own and we've reviewed back in episode 115. It's in the cards. Um, we found the learning curve on this one quite steep. The rule book is reminds me of reading the rules for Magic the Gathering with all its weird timing mechanics and stuff. And that's because the Pathfinder Adventure card game does have tournament play. And you could tell the game had been out for many years before this new card set. And it was a little overwhelming. Um, Besides that, I do like some of the mechanics in this game. For one, it uses a bunch of dice, though oddly, being based on D&D and Pathfinder doesn't use a D20. But you are rolling lots of dice, which gives you that RPG feel, and I really like the way that most of the gear and equipment had two ways to use it, where you could use it on your turn to do something, but you could also use it on another player's turn, which I thought was really neat, and showed that cooperation that you get in a good RPG party. Uh, What I didn't like is that when you built the decks for every scenario, you basically used every card you owned and it just ended up that you were just like facing the same threats, traps, monsters and puzzles over, over in random places. And you just didn't really get the feel that every scenario was significantly different from the last. Yes, the boss fight was different. The whole game's all about capturing the lieutenant, defeating the henchman, capture the lieutenant, close the sights. Every game started to feel kind of the same, especially when using the same cards. And yes, there are more cards out there and you can add more in, but they still just get randomized with everything else. So to me, that's where it kind of fell apart, though it's fantastic for replayability. When you play that first scenario of the Pathfinder Adventure card game, it's going to be different every time you play it, which opens it up to playing with various different groups. This is one I think Sean needs to try. You never got a chance to try this one out. We should go back to it. I do have the first expansion for the core set that we never even got to. There's some neat stuff going on, and I like it. I just didn't love it. Fair enough. And that was the Pathfinder Adventure card game, specifically the core set. Learn about the newest Pathfinder Adventure core set in our review on the blog and YouTube. Now, moving from the Pathfinder Adventure card game, which most group liked but didn't love, let's move on to an adventure card game we all adore, and that's Mm -hmm. the Aventuria Adventure card game, a game set in the world of the Dark Eye or Das Schwarzog, Germany's most popular fantasy RPG. While this game can be played as a two to four player dueling card game, somewhat like Magic, 
The real draw here is the cooperative story mode. Mm -hmm. This mode features detailed stories based on classic Dark Eye adventures where you will have to get through a number of skill checks before moving on to a combat encounter and where who those combat encounters are often about way more than just beating up on the main baddie. Everyone we've played this game with has loved it. Where Aventuria does fall down a bit is in regards to character progression. Mm -hmm. Now, while you can increase your character's skills and add treasure cards to your decks, it's just not quite enough customization for a game based on an RPG. We also would have liked to have seen more branching paths in the stories, which are both things we've been promised by the publisher will be coming with a future expansion. Yeah, this is a game we would be talking about a lot more often, and we were for a period, but we kind of stopped because it became impossible to get a hold of. Like, we like it enough, we could probably be talking about what we did in Adventuria this week, kind of like we did for Gloomhaven. We tried a new character, we tried a new scenario, we tried this new book. The problem was, we were telling people this, and they were getting mad at us for good reason, because they couldn't buy the game. They're like, stop talking about this great sounding game, you got me sold, I want to buy it, but I can't find it. Well, good news. This is now back in print in North America. Badish news. Before going live tonight, I decided to actually look around to see where I could find it. Like, I've got the notice. It's now available here again. And the only place I can find it on the web right now is direct from Studio 2, who is the North American publisher. So while it's out there and they have copies, I guess it's still going to be a little while before you start seeing it at your friendly local game stores or other online retailers. I don't quite know what the holdup is, but at least it is available on the market again. And that was the Adventuria Adventure Card Game, which, of course, you can learn a lot more about the core rules and some of the expansions on our reviews, again, on the blog and YouTube. Now, speaking of games back in print, that leads me to Hero Quest, which technically has a longer name and I can never remember. I think it's like the Hero Quest Adventure System, but I think everyone knows what I'm talking about when I say Hero Quest. This is a dungeon crawling board game originally released when we were kids that really should have been in last week's episode. Like, how did I miss talking about Hero Quest when I was talking about games we played as kids that I still enjoy today? Um, we bought the new Deluxe Super Edition that came out. I totally missed that one last week. I don't know how I messed that up. Anyway, Hero Quest was originally a joint project between Milton Bradley and Games Workshop. It's a very light adventure game set in the Warhammer world without saying it was set in the Warhammer world. Um, now, this one isn't quite cooperative. It's one versus many, where one player is playing like a simplified dungeon master role with the other players cooperating and trying to defeat the scenario. Now, the rules here are dead simple, uh, featuring some pretty dated mechanics like roll and move. You literally roll to see how many squares you move your character. Um, there's a uh, miss a turn. Like if you hit a trap, you miss a turn. But it does have a lightning quick, fun combat system of opposed rolls using special dice, which at the time was pretty innovative. And now we see all over the place. Um, now, a lot of people grew grew up playing this game and loved it. And Hasbro recently brought it back through their Hasbro Pulse crowdfunding thing. Now, this new edition is almost identical to the old edition in all of its awesomeness and all of its flaws. While I still find the game to be quite fun, I don't enjoy it nearly as much as many of the other dungeon crawlers and adventure games on the list tonight. But I think this is a game to keep on the list because it has such a huge group of fans, longtime fans looking for a kick of kick in the pants on nostalgia, like are going to still enjoy this game. It's the game you grew up with. They they have not significantly changed anything except for losing the Warhammer license, so having to redo all the artwork. Yeah, it's important to remember that this was done by Hasbro Pulse, not Restoration Games. Yes. Who could have <laughs> turned this into a better game. <laughs> and that was Hero Quest. All right, my next one is Descent or the series of games in the Descent uh thing from fantasy flight games uh this started off as a one versus many huge box game you can see my coffin behind me there that's the edition i own um this has changed over time it's now on its third iteration um and it's now a fully cooperative game now the first edition the one i have behind me was this epic quest featuring giant maps a series of scenarios that took hours to complete and eventually telling a complete story over multiple expansions. 
it was a long, epic, almost lifestyle game. It was it was more of a gloomhaven, right? Whereas second edition improved on things by breaking the game into smaller, more manageable chunks with a much shorter playing time so you could actually fit in one or possibly two games in a night instead of having to dedicate an entire evening to play. Now, partway through second edition, they did something pretty awesome. They released an app which turned the entire game into a cooperative game instead of a one versus many game, which also added more scenarios and campaign and legacy elements and ways to keep your progression in the app. So that was pretty cool. Now there's a third game in the series, Descent Legends of the Dark, which I haven't personally gotten to try, but I wanted to throw in here as I'm talking about the Descent games anyway. Now this is also fully cooperative and app-based, but from what I hear, it's very divergent from the first two of the series. This isn't meant to be Descent 3rd Edition. It's meant to be a different game in the Descent universe, and from what I hear, it's more based on Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle-Earth. I can't compare those myself, but I did want to share that. Overall, the series is... is the opposite of Gloomhaven. This is the adventure game. This is the dice chucking miniature game with a story behind it, mainly just there to set up each scenario and map and challenge you. The app event, uh, sorry, the app adding in branching paths and everything added more of that RPG feel. And that was the Descent series of games from Fantasy Flight. Next, I've got Mice and Mystics. Our chat room called this one out earlier, which is a good good call. Uh, this is a fantasy dungeon crawler with a great theme and an amazing story. Honestly, one of the best stories in a board game out there. It feels like you are taking part in a children's storybook. Though I got to say, this is not a kid's game, as I learned trying to teach my kids way too early. This is a this is a heavier one. It's a, it's a dice-based mechanic, tactical miniature-driven combat, but also some puzzle solving, having to deal with, you know, like rushing water or using the right tool in the right place now the thing missing here though is character progression other than getting new gear really all you have is the story progression like the things carry over how you did you can unlock some achievements but you don't get a lot of change to the characters though they do do some neat stuff where new options open up new tools open up and even a new character will open up part way through so there's some of that there this one was borderline for me. I wasn't quite sure to throw it on the list, but it, I think it captures just enough. And I just love the theme of you are playing like a prince in his retinue who got turned into mice and having to resolve that. And that was Mice and Mystics. Now, this one's a logical follow-up. Sticking with Plaid Hat Games, storybook games, we have Stuffed Fables. This, despite being from the exact same team that did Mice and Mystics, is a much different game. It's it's much easier to learn. It's got a more family-friendly story because I got to say the being turned into mice is more, um, not horror, but like, oh, you're mice and you're, you're being hunted and tried to kill. Whereas this is much more whimsy and family-friendly and honestly just a much more approachable game overall with simpler mechanics, uh, more compartmentalized, easier to put away and take out. Now, the story here is amazing. This is still my favorite theme in all board games is you are the stuffies of a little girl who's about to spend her first night in her big bed and you have to defend her from the things under the bed. And I'm like, that that is just awesome. I want to play this as an RPG. If it's not out there yet, someone must have done it. I would totally do this as an RPG. Now, this features a branching path and a mix of combat, non-combat adventures. While Mice and Mystics was pretty much just move on to the next combat, there was a whole adventure where you're sitting there in a toy cart, bouncing down a pile of toys in the dreamlands, having to make skill checks to hold on, right? It just did so much more. Unfortunately, unlike Mice and Mystics, though, there is not a lot of character progression here, but the story makes up for it. This is also the first game we mentioned tonight that doesn't have a fantasy theme. And that was, well, a specific style of fantasy. <laughs> High fantasy, I guess. Well, it, it was, it was, it's, it, well, yeah, but it's modern. Yeah. You're, you're using plungers and it's right. a, it's a kid in a modern bed. It's, it's not, not fantasy as in medieval fantasy. But not medieval fantasy. Yes, yes. And that was Stuffed Fables. Now, sticking with games set in modern times, the next game is The Ghosts Betwixt. This is a retro-modern dungeon crawler set in the 90s in America's haunted heartland. You take on the role of a family trying to rescue one of their kids that has been kidnapped and is being held at an abandoned theme park. This is a pretty meaty tactical dice-driven dungeon crawler with lengthy gameplay and a mm -hmm. solid campaign. Now, the big draw here is how replayable 
the game is, with many randomly generated elements used every chapter. This has everything Jim is looking for with complex characters, co-op, different improvement options leading to various different character builds, growing complexity as the campaign goes on. Yeah, we just reviewed this one uh, just right around Halloween, and I encourage you to read my full review before buying this one. The big thing to watch here is to not be fooled by the look of this game. Mm -hmm. Despite the vaguely Scooby-Doo cartoonish look, this is not a Saturday morning cartoon game, neither in difficulty nor theme. That was The Ghost Betwixt. So moving from modern to the future, or, well, technically a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, I have Star Wars Imperial Assault. Now, similar to Descent, this game launched as a one-versus-many game, where one player took on the role of the Empire, and the other players played a band of rebels. Now, this has changed with the release of the Star Wars Imperial Assault app, which now offers fully cooperative play and a more campaign feel. Now, this game features everything Jim's looking for while doing a great job of adding to the Star Wars universe. What I love here is that your characters are first and foremost to the story, and famous heroes and villains of the series only show up as adversaries and allies. Like, you're never going to get to play Han Solo, but Han Solo, if you beat a certain mission, may join you later as an ally to kind of give you a bonus, which I think is really well done. This is some of the best use of the Star Wars license I've seen. You get dice-based combat and character progression through improving equipment and abilities. Perhaps best of all is just how replayable this game is due to the way you basically build a campaign deck at the start of the game, deciding what to include and exclude from every scenario. Uh, based on even just in the core box, there's lots of variability, but every expansion you add gives you more things you can throw into that deck to make things more interesting. Now, as an added bonus, which isn't relevant to tonight's question or Jim's question, you also get a fully realized two-player skirmish miniature game out of this as well. Though I think most Star Wars miniature gamers have moved on to Legion, you still get that in the box. And that was Star Wars Imperial Assault. So that went quicker than I thought. That, that's 10. That was 10 adventure games that we enjoy and that we think are worth checking out if you're looking for an RPG experience in board game form. Now let's move on to a few honorable mentions. These are games we dig, but just didn't quite fit our definition. To start, I've got Mansions of Madness, a Cthulhu Mythos board game. This, like Descent, started off with a first edition that was one versus many. But forget that one. Throw it out. Sell it. Find, find someone to take it off your hands because you want the app-driven second edition of this game. Now, in this game, everyone picks an investigator, tells the app what fancies you have, and then start an investigation, which almost everyone, as far as I know, everyone I played starts with you entering a mansion, exploring it and trying to figure out what's going on and then what you need to do to stop whatever horrible thing that is. Now, the game mix features a good mix of puzzles and combat and is quite immersive due to how well the app is integrated with background sounds and voiceover. And the puzzles are actually all done on the apps. So you get like physical things to manipulate. While I do feel you get an RPG like experience here with a variety of characters to choose from and a great story, there's no campaign here. This is not a campaign game. This is more like playing a one shot with each scenario being its own thing. And I've got to say, you know, this is actually our third app heavy game on yes. this list. And there are certainly going to be some people who will, uh, you know, put up a fight because of that all on its own. It's true. Uh, but uh, to each their own. We've also got several here that have no app integration whatsoever. Now, next up, I've got a solo game that can also be played cooperatively, and that's Hellbringer. Mm hmm. Now, we weren't initially sure if we should put this on the list, since the game isn't actually published yet. Their first attempt at crowdfunding, unfortunately, didn't work out. But they are trying again in the new year in March. They've already scheduled the Kickstarter. So the reason we decided to include this was because it was such a big surprise to both of us. Mm -hmm. This is a card-driven dungeon crawler that recreates the feel of roguelike computer games and the waves of enemies you face in games like Diablo. The deck is your dungeon, and each card drawn represents you digging deeper. It features a unique Fog of War targeting system and the rolling of lots and lots and lots of dice. Yeah, this one was really solid. I, I, this, I, by the time we do a week in review, year in review, this may be our biggest surprise on our, on our list here. This was 
it was way more enjoyable than we thought it'd be. I really do hope the um, the publisher and designer are able to get this out to people's hands. Um, there's some questionable choices in their, their production choices, I think, are making things more difficult for themselves than they need to be. But I just want more people to play this game. Um, I'm even going to recommend this if you can get a print and play, which I'm not sure if you can. If you can get a print and play, this is a great card game that plays fantastic solo. More than that, eh. Unless he's done some changes, it was okay multiplayer. So that was Hellbringer, which hopefully more people will get to actually play next year. Feel free to check out our preview on the blog and YouTube. Find out why we were so surprised by this one. Now, my other honorable mention tonight is the Warhammer Quest Adventure card game. Honestly, this should be up there with the rest of the games. This would have been number 11. Actually, probably would have been earlier. It's not like they're ranked anyway. I liked it that much. The problem is the game was canceled before it was really able to get going. The fact that it feels like an incomplete box as it is. All that's out there are initial four characters and a sample short adventure that comes in the court set. It's a multi-part adventure, but you can tell it was just like to get you... That give you something to sink your teeth into, but just left you wanting more, and there is no more. Um, there's someone, there's like a, they put out a character that was a promo. You can kind of download that, but there's no more adventures except for what fans have created. As it stands, this is still, even with that, that problem, my second favorite adventure card game, second only to Adventuria. And I got to say, if they had kept putting stuff out for it, it might've grown to be my first. There was just the way you were forced to take different actions. You had a bunch of different actions to take. And as you use them, you flip them over and then you had an action that would flip them all back. I love that mechanic. And it means that you're not just doing the same thing after you turn after turn, which is something that can drive me bonkers in these kind of games where you're just like, I move and I attack, I move and I attack. You couldn't do that. Plus there was some great ways to take actions on other player turns and help each other out. Plus, I love Warhammer, so just like playing a group of like a troll slayer, a bright mage, a priest of Sigmar, and a wood elf fighting waves of Skaven is just awesome to me. Now, I do know this was reprinted as a new game, and I can't remember the name of it. Bad on me for not looking this up. Set in Fantasy Flight's Tyranoth universe, which is where the, all the Descent games are set and where their Midnight RPG was set. The big draw to me, besides the mechanics here, was the Warhammer. Without the Warhammer license, I honestly are not even interested in checking it out, even though I did like the mechanics. It just, Warhammer means that much to me. Fair enough. That was Warhammer Quest, the adventure card game. And I just would like to point out, while you can't apparently get Hellbringer print and play right now, if you have Tabletop Simulator, there okay. is an official Tabletop Simulator mod available. All right, so those are the games we played in the past and enjoyed. But there are a lot of RPG in a box style games that are out there that we haven't played. The chat room's already mentioned a few of them, which we'll get to when we get to the lobby. What I want to do is wrap up with three games we're curious about and would love to try out. Number one for me is Shadow of Brimstone. Shadows. I always think it's Shadow. Shadows of Brimstone. So this features a unique theme of being set in the Old West, where you're going to play Old West stereotypes. You got your lawman and your gunslinger, those type of characters. The thing is, you're investigating a nearby mine, but they have a secret. These mines feature portals to other worlds. Now, the original core set featured a mythos and speakable horror theme and some demons, which did that, that's kind of neat to me. But later expansions had mines that led you to like ancient Egypt and another one where you literally go to another planet and fight aliens. And that just something about that really appeals to me. I like the concept of the mashed up universes thrown in with that old West feel. It features tactical miniature based combat, a system for leveling up your characters between expeditions where you're going to town in between it gives me a little uh, foreshadowing a uh, reminder of like Mordheim style games, which is a skirmish game, which is why it's not on our list. Um, like squad based. I, I really want to try Shadows of Brimstone, even though I have heard it is a beast to learn and one of the more fiddly games out there. Well, for me, I have to say that while I'm not a huge fan of the cost of their games, Demon <laughs> certainly does put out some solid ones, especially if you're looking for an adventure in a box. Mm -hmm. In this case, Massive Darkness a fantasy RPG with all the arguably overproduced beauty that is a Simon game. 
asymmetric co-op heroes, XP, equipment gathering. This one has it all. Now, the current version is actually Massive Darkness 2, Hellscape. But either one, I think you're going to get a whole pack of stuff because, well, you're buying a game from Simon. <laughs> yes. How many Simon dungeon crawlers are there? Um, I'm going to throw another one in here just as a bonus. This is on the ones we want to try. It should, could have been in the follow-up, and I when I'm doing research for this episode. Simon's Arcadia Quest came up mm -hmm. a lot. That came up on a lot of other people's recommendations. To me, you are playing a team of three characters, and the only actual progression is whoever won the game gets a benefit later. So it didn't have that progression. So that's why I didn't throw it on the list. But that came up a lot on other... Like, if you Google best dungeon crawlers, <laughs> everyone seems to have that one. Yep. Now, the other game I want to play, I already own. I've got it. It's sitting downstairs. I've even recorded an unboxing video for it, which I think is live. I don't even remember. Um, that's Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle Earth. Now, our friends Tori and Kat are currently playing through a campaign of this. They finished the core box, and they're on to some expansion content with some of their other friends. And they are loving it. And often they show up Friday nights for game night with us and tell us about their adventures. And that game sounds great. This sounds like it has everything Jim is looking for as well with an app driven again, branching campaign, lots of character progression, true cooperative play and other RPG elements. It's also well supported with new content coming out regularly, which is something we didn't really mention above in our games. If these games were still out, still supported. Um, this is one that's still got content coming out to it. So it's not a dead game. Whereas say Star Wars Imperial Assault at this point is still being published. You can still get everything, but they're not releasing anything new. Uh, this just looks great. Um, the only reason I haven't played it is because Tori and Kat are already playing, and that's who we tend to play legacy campaign games with. We were playing Ghost Betwix with them, so they played them. Now that Sean's in town, maybe we'll start up a three-player campaign and actually see how good Journeys in Middle-earth is. Well, that's our list of RPGs in a box. Adventure games without the RPG bookcase. <laughs> Do you prefer to dungeon delve from books or boxes? Let us know in the comments. Remember, we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. If you've got a question for us, head over to tabletopbellhop.com, click on Ask the Bellhop, fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or hit us up on social media where I can be found anywhere, anywhere, everywhere, pretty close, as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, if you'd like to hear what we talk about in our lobby, but couldn't be here live, $5 and up patrons get all the audio otherwise left on the cutting room floor.